All right. Um, well, let's go ahead and get into it. I'm excited today. This is going to be a fun topic. A uh, good time for sure. Uh, let's pray real quick. Ask God to bless this study of his word. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you as blind <laughs> in need of help. Lord, these, these topics can be difficult. They can be overwhelming. Um, that doesn't mean that we we back off from making arguments and, and biblical arguments. But Lord, that means that we have some humility. So Lord, as we, as we try to study this, I, I pray that you would just bless our time today. Help us see past some of the technicalities to, to what you're really trying to show us through all of this. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So first off, I want to thank Aaron for being so incredibly non-committal last week in any <laughs> position on the second coming whatsoever. He just threw me under the bus. Um, I get to ta tackle all the hard parts, but we are covering the millennium today. Um, so it's, it's, it's going to be a good time, and I'm excited to get into it. It's quite a bit of stuff. Um, I'll just say at the outset that there's a lot of terms that I'm going the book brought up and, and I'm going to be bringing up and I'll try to define really quickly but we're going to probably have to move pretty fast so um, it's, a, it's a it's a study that demands more um, attention than just this Bible study for sure um, and it's a good thing to study um, a lot of times we get afraid of studying the end times and the millennium and things like this um, but, but it's good it's good so let's with that in mind let's go ahead and jump into it. Um, the millennium concerns primarily the passage in, in Revelation chapter 20 where it talks about um, Satan being bound and Christ reigning for a thousand years with some of his martyred saints um, for a thousand years, like I said, until Satan is then released back into the earth to gather kind of an army against God um, for this final battle and Jesus just comes and kind of wipes them out really quickly. There's not even a battle, uh, really. But it's over really quickly after that. But we're talking about this period of the millennium specifically. And before we get into specifics, I just want to say um, there are a lot of different views on this topic. I probably have different views than many of the people in here. Um, so just from the outset, we need to show a lot of grace. Um, this is on our scale, probably a third tier doctrine. Um, so those things that we can be in the same body, in the same church, and fellowship together and disagree upon, um, have good disagreements upon. Um, and so just keep that in mind um, when we discuss these things, maybe not in here specifically, but outside of here um, especially. I see it a lot. People get really heated about this topic. And uh, I, I don't want to say there's a lot of vagueness, but there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, for us when we study these things. So just as we go into it, um, just have, let's have an attitude of humility, attitude of um, listening to the other people. Um, but let's go ahead and turn to Revelation chapter 20 real quick, and we're going to read those first eight verses to kind of figure out what we're talking about here. Revelation chapter 20, starting in verse 1 down to verse 8. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he threw him into the abyss and shut it and sealed it over him, so that he would not deceive the nations any longer. Until the thousand years were completed, after these things he must be released for a short time. Then I saw the thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received the mark on their forehead and on their hand. And they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until a thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who has part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power. But they will be priests of God and Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. 
when the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for the war. The number of them is like the sand of the seashore. So that's the primary text um, that we're considering. We're going to go honestly to a lot of different places um, because there's just a wide variety of topics and, and opinions on these verses. But that from the outset is what we're talking about. This millennial reign where Christ sets up his kingdom, the, Satan is thrown into the pit somehow, um, and there's obviously differences of opinion on this, um, but somehow he is bound for a thousand years. And at the end of that time, Christ, Satan's been released and then Christ comes and and destroys all of Satan and his armies and throws them into the lake of fire. And so that's, in this topic specifically, we're talking about, okay, how does this relate to Christ's second coming? So is the millennium prior to Christ's second coming? Or is the millennium after Christ's second coming? So there, there are basically two schools of thought two big schools of thought. That is premillennialism and postmillennialism. Premillennialism is the idea that Christ will return prior to the millennium, set up his kingdom on earth, reign with his saints for a thousand years until the beast is released at the end. Whereas postmillennialism is exactly the opposite. So the millennium happens and then Christ returns and the end comes. Um, and so those are the two big views and those two are separated into two smaller views and um, these are dispensational premillennialism or pre-trib premillennialism and that's a lot of terms I know but and then historic premillennialism, premillennialism and I'm going to get tongue, tongue tied saying that over and over again but anyways so those are the two two premillennials um, and specifically uh, dispensational premillennialism, premillennialism um, is usually characterized by, and this is just a short overview, we're going to get into them more thoroughly, but usually characterized by um, maintaining a separation between Israel and the church in the eschaton, so in this millennium and in the future, there's maintains a separation between Israel and the church. And they say that prior to um, the millennium, there will be a seven-year great tribulation, and the church will actually be raptured out before that tribulation occurs. So Christ comes back. Um, a lot of them call it a secret rapture. Christ comes back, or a secret return, raptures his people, the Gentile people. There's seven years of tribulation where specifically the, the wrath of revelation is being poured out. Um, and that's the tribulation. And in that time, a lot of Jews will be converted. Um, Jewish believers, the 144,000 specifically, some of them take it literally, some of them don't. But, so that's the defining characteristic of pre-tribulational or dispensational premillennialism is that church is raptured out before the tribulation. And then historic premillennialism is just the other side of that. And that is, the church will be raptured out after the tribulation. Um, and there are a lot of different specifics, and we're going to get into um, how they break those two down, but just overview at the beginning. That's the distinctions between the two. The other two are both technically post-millennial views. That is, Christ returns after the millennium. So Christ is reigning in some form or another. In post-millennialism, Specifically, uh, we're talking about Christ, the, the church is actually, and the kingdom of God is going to actually expand throughout history, and they're going to get more controlling influence. So that um, even prior to Christ coming back, there's actually going to be a period where the church has controlling influence. Uh, most people are converted, if not um, specifically influenced by Christian culture, so that um, the church on earth prior to Christ's second return has overriding influence. That's post-millennialism. And then our millennialism is technically a post-mill system as well. But theirs specifically says that 
when Christ comes in his first advent, that is when he comes the first time, he sets up his kingdom. He inaugurates his kingdom. And he reigns in that kingdom until he comes back the second time. And so that whole time period from Christ's first advent to Christ's second advent would be the millennium and then the second coming at the end of that. And so those are generally the distinctions between the two. And we're going <laughs> to, a lot of theology here, but we're going to get into it. So before we jump to looking at these views specifically, I do want to say something about kind of the presuppositions behind a lot of these views. Um, so obviously dispensational premillennialism is influenced by dispensational theology. And a lot of the characteristics are the same that we just talked about. Dispensational theology characterizes itself on being literal, a literal interpretation of Scripture. So everywhere you can, um, everywhere you possibly can, you interpret the Scripture literally. Um, so that means that all of the promises given to the people of Israel, the nation of Israel, are in place until God actually fulfills those promises. And so that's why whenever Christ comes and sets up his millennial reign, the temple is actually rebuilt, the sacrificial system is put back in place so that Christ can fulfill the land promises to the people of Israel specifically. And then the church has different promises. that, And so that's dispensational theology. Um, it's characterized by seven different dispensations um, or ways that God interacts with his people. So the first one is the dispensation of innocence. That's before the fall. Then the dispensation of conscience, which is the fall to Noah. The dispensation of human government, which is Noah to Abraham. And then promise, which is Abraham to Moses. Law, Moses to Christ. Grace, which is the church age, which is what we're in now in the dispensational system. And then the kingdom will be the future in the millennium and following. So they see God's interaction with humanity in these seven different ways throughout history. And specifically, God kind of stays in those lanes when he is acting with humanity. So in the church age, in the age of grace, specifically, usually they say God is not pouring out any wrath right now. Um, that this is a, an age of grace and that wrath is reserved for later on um, during the tribulation. And so that's a, a quick overview of dispensational theology. It's, there's a lot more to it um, and a lot more behind it. But that's kind of the governing system that you see why um, they'll interpret things the way that we do, they do when we get to um, their millennial views. Um, the next one is progressive dispensational theology, and it's, it's really similar. Um, they don't make as big of a distinction between Israel and the church. Um, and usually, they, these guys would be post-mill or, or post-trib or, or mid-trib or something of that. And that just means that Christ is, um, the, tri Christ, the tribulation is happening. Uh, the rapture is happening sometime during the tribulation or after the tribulation. Um, and then there's covenant theology, which is going to probably be uh, more associated with post-millennialism and amillennialism. And that specifically is um, the idea that God primarily works in, two, in covenants with his people um, and characterized in two specific covenants. And the first covenant is the covenant of works, which he gave to Adam. Eat of this fruit... Um, if you don't, you will surely die. Or, or if you eat of this fruit, you will surely die. Um, and so that's the covenant of works. And Adam obviously fails the covenant of works. And so the next covenant then is the covenant of grace, which runs throughout all the streams of the different covenants. Um, so the Abrahamic covenant and the Mosaic covenant, and then obviously the covenant, the new covenant with Christ. And so that covenant grace, covenant of grace running throughout all those systems. And so that's how they interpret. And so when you get... They'll, there's, in this system, there's a lot of unity, obviously, then between Israel and the church. And they would say, not that the church has replaced Israel, but that Israel and the church are one people of God throughout all time. And so I just wanted to touch on that really briefly, and I know it's heavy theology, um, but this is overriding systems. This is things that are influencing interpretation. And so it's not just, oh, we come to Revelation chapter 20, and you see it differently and I see it differently. It's, a lot of this is different ways we interpret the entirety of the scriptural narrative. 
And so it's important, um, maybe not that important, but it is important. But let's jump in here. This is the first view. I hope you guys can see that really well. Um, we're we're going to go over dispensational theology or pre-tribulation, pre-millennialism. And so, like I said, and we'll just go over this kind of again, at when Christ comes, he sets up the church age, which is this dispensation of grace. And um, specifically, God is dealing mostly with Gentiles during this period. Um, and all of this keeps going on until the rapture. And the rapture is when the Gentile church will be taken out of the world, specifically. So um, I'm not trying to trivialize or anything, but think left behind. Like people are taking out and um, everyone else is left. And during that seven years of tribulation, like I said, this is when the 144,000 Jews, Jewish people are converted. Um, it's a time of great tribulation. Um, and all that occurs for seven years until Christ comes back and sets up his kingdom. Um, and when he sets up this kingdom, then he's going to fulfill his promises to his people. Specifically to the Gentiles, he's going to fulfill all the promises given to the church. And his people, Israel, he's going to fulfill all the land promises specifically. He set, reset up the temple like we talked about. Um, and all of that continues for, most of the time, um, people who advocate this view would say for a literal thousand years um, until the final judgment. And that's when, so the first resurrection we saw at the beginning of the millennium when all the saints are raised to reign with Christ. The second resurrection will actually be at the end when all the unbelievers are raised to be judged. And so that's their basic timeline. There's some other information on here about dispensational theologians and whatnot, but that's the basic timeline when we talk about dispensational premillennialism. Some of the characteristics, obviously, they're going to have a futurist interpretation of all relevant prophecies. Um, so whether that is Revelation, the book of Revelation is all in the future. Um, if it's Matthew 24 that we're talking about, the Olivet Discourse, um, where Jesus kind of gives us the signs of the time and stuff like that. Um, that's all going to be future for in dispensational theology. Like we said, it's a literal interpretation of Scripture. Um, so that's how you get the thousand years. That's how you get the distinction between Israel and the church. Everywhere it says Israel, we want to take it for what it's saying. We don't want to spiritualize those promises given to Israel and apply them to the church because that's not a literal interpretation. Um, and then, like we said, the church is raptured out prior to the Great Tribulation. Um, and then here are some of the arguments... And the way I kind of set this up is I tried to cover some distinct arguments for each one. Um, obviously, there's going to be significant overlap between both forms of premillennialism. Um, but I'm going to look specifically at their, their arguments for the pre-tribulation rapture, which is distinct to dispensational theology. So let's look at Revelation chapter 4 really quick. Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I had heard, like the sound of a trumpet, speaking with me, said, Come up here, and I will show you what may, must take place after these things. Okay, so specifically, if you just read that verse, you're going, okay, what's the argument here? Specifically, what the, is being said is that up to this point in the book of Revelation, the first three chapters, Jesus has been addressing churches individually, specifically churches. After this point in the book of Revelation, you do not see the church mentioned anymore as the church. And so um, I'm not going to comment on whether I think this is a right interpretation. I'm just going to say um, at this point, um, so when he says, come with me, and I'll show you what has to take place after these things, is when the church is taking, taken up. Um, and then that's when you see the rest of the wrath poured out after that. Um, and so that's kind of their number one argument for pre-tribulation rapture is Revelation chapter 4. Church is raptured out at this point in the book of Revelation. Then Revelation 3.10 It says, because you have kept the word, he's talking to Philadelphia at this point, because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I will also keep you from the hour of testing, 
that hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. So, again, it, their argument being, if this what's happening in Revelation um, throughout the whole book is God's wrath being poured out during the Great Tribulation, then the church is going to be kept from that if they're faithful. And so, argument number two, let's go to 1 Thessalonians 1.10. I did not mark the places in my Bible, so I'm going to be turning. So you guys are welcome to turn with me. Um, you are witnesses, and so is God. How devoutly and uprightly and blamelessly we have... That is not right. Let's try this one. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath to come. And so it's the same idea. Especially in dispensational theology, God is not outpouring wrath now. He will in the tribulation. And so the church needs to be taken out before that actually occurs if God's going to be faithful to his promises not to pour out wrath on his people. And then, so that's, that's one of the distinctions for dispensational premillennialism. The other one is the separation of Israel and the church. And I'll be honest, I looked and looked and there's not a lot of passages um, that they cite for this. Just that there are outstanding promises to um, Israel specifically that have still yet to be fulfilled. Land promises most specifically. And so those need to be fulfilled if God is not going to be a liar. Um, if God is actually going to keep his promises, they need to be fulfilled to that people group. Um, and one of, the, one of the issues, and I'm going to try to do this with everyone, uh, uh, just bring up a negative. But one of the issues is, is that usually what happens in dispensational premillennialism is that they are not allowing the New Testament to interpret some of the promises given to those, the people groups. Um, and we'll look at that specifically when we talk about all millennialism, but we're saying, uh, they would say specifically that... Um, those promises given to the people of Israel are actually expanded to include the new heavens and the new earth and they're fulfilled in the church. But that's kind of the distinctions for dispensational premillennialism. Like I said, I, I'll be up front right now so that we don't get too far in this without you guys knowing. I hold to all millennialism um, as far as all these views are concerned. And so I, I don't um, buy all the arguments here um, but that being said, I'm trying to at least give a fair shake to everyone and, and just without commenting my own views um, on these. But let's go. Historic premillennialism. That's the next one that we're going to cover. Historic premillennialism, um, like we said, is similar to dispensational, but they actually have a completely different framework by which they interpret the scriptures. So this... Uh, kind of give us a picture of what's going on in historic premillennialism. So, um, on Christ's first advent, he kind of sets up, manifests his kingdom on the earth and gives us insight into what the kingdom is going to be like. And the, the kingdom remains in place throughout this uh, age, this church age, um, by the power of the Holy Spirit, acting in the lives of believers through the preaching of the gospel those things. And all of that happens up until Christ returns. So in this view, there is no secret rapture. Um, believers are not raptured out prior to the tribulation. Um, and we'll go over some of the views why, specifically why Wayne Grudem s said that uh, he doesn't believe in the pre-tribulational rapture. Um, but this is, Christ comes back, sets up his kingdom, and after that, it's pretty much similar to other forms, the other premillennialism. Uh, the saints reign with Christ. Satan is bound so that he can't deceive the nations any longer. And then all of that happens until the second resurrection where unbelievers are raised um, and judged and Satan is defeated. And so specifically, historic premillennialism, that's kind of the timeline. Um, this is actually probably the earliest attested in church history. So you'll see a lot of the early church fathers, Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, say things like this, um, that they believe that Christ will return and then set up his kingdom on the earth. Um, so that, that's a good argument. 
is that a lot of the church for um, especially the early church who were closest to the apostles believed these things. Um, the next is they're going to have a futurist interpretation of most of these passages of scripture as well. So everything, um, prophecies that are occurring, we're talking about these things are going to happen in the end, in the times to come. Um, and you can usually they don't see a, a big distinction between Israel and the church. You can, uh, like I said, there's a lot of overlap in these and you can be in weird positions on the scale. Um, but most of the time, historic premillennialists don't adopt the same um, interpretive uh, guide to how they interpret these uh, scriptures. And so that's historic premillennialism. The return of Christ and the rapture will come after the Great Tribulation and then... Um, whether or not it's a literal thousand years depends on who you talk to. But most of the time, they don't see any reason to, to question the, the literalness of the thousand years. Um, so specifically, arguments for premillennialism. And these are going to be arguments for premillennialism against uh, both forms of postmillennialism. And so the Old Testament seems to point toward a time that is not yet an eternal state, and yet is different than the present state. And so, let's turn to Isaiah 65. Really quick. And kind of look at just, see how this time differs from our current state. Starting in verse 20. And it says, No longer will there be in it an infant who lives but a few days, or an old man who does not live out his days. For the youth will die at the age of 100, and the one who does not reach the age of 100 will be, bro will be thought accursed. And so we're talking about a time period in which is different than right now. Right? And specifically, he talks about, I will create a new heavens and a new earth, and the form of things will not be remembered in verse 17. This is, uh, or come to mind, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, I create Jer Jerusalem for rejoicing, and her people for gladness. And so we're talking about a time when he's going to come back, set up a new heavens and a new earth, but it seems like people are still dying. They're living out their, their years, living to 100, but... Um, it's not yet an eternal state where people aren't dying anymore. Um, and it seems to be something in between is what the premillennialists would argue here. Um, let's go to Zechariah 14. More of the same. Starting in verse 5. You will flee by the valley of my mountains, for the valley of mountains will reach to Azel. Yes, you will flee just as you fled before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come and all the holy ones with him. And so this is where we get the language. In that day there will be no light. The luminaries will dwindle. For it will be a unique day which is known to the Lord. Neither day nor night, but will come about at that evening time there will be light. And so it's kind of this weird situation where, again, um, it seems different than now. But we still got night and day. We still got regular things that characterize our existence right now. But different than now. Um, and then there are several New, Testa New Testament passages which they argue um, refer to a future millennium. Look at Revelation chapter 2 really quickly. Starting in verse 26. He who overcomes and he who keeps my deeds until the end to him I will give authority over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces as I also have received authority from my father. And so here we go. Saints are, are ruling with Christ, but they are ruling over the nations, rebellious nations that they rebuke with a rod of iron. And so they're saying, this is some inner stage. Like, it's not yet eternal state where all these things have been taken care of, and it's not yet, and it, but it's not the present state. It's, it's saints reigning with Christ. And so those are basic arguments. Let's move on to post-millennialism because... I feel like I'm running out of time already. Um, so postmillennialism is the idea, and we talked about this a little bit before, 
but that the church is going to basically expand and increase throughout time and get more governing influence over the world to the point that, and they don't have a specific timeline necessarily. At some point um, in the middle of Christ's first advent and Christ's first advent is when the millennium starts, but there's no specific timeline. But um, just that throughout time, these things will keep increasing Christian influence will keep expanding. God's gospel will keep conquering to the point that where the world is mostly Christian and people um, mostly observe the morality of Christianity, if nothing else. Um, oftentimes, uh, these postmillennialists are preterist. It's just a word that means past, which means they believe, and more likely partial preterist, but um, it, just belie- it just means that they think that some of the events talking about the Great Tribulation um, have already been fulfilled. Um, specifically fulfilled in the destruction of the temple in AD 70. So Christ comes up, sets up this new age, which they would actually argue is the new covenant age. So they, that's how they separate the ages. Um, the old covenant age and the new covenant age. So Christ comes up, in his first advent, sets up his kingdom in this new covenant age, and the old covenant age is passing away. And it does so until you get specifically in AD 70, the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem that stops the old covenant for good, which has not, to this point, is their argument, been restored at all. Um, and so that's kind of how they see uh, the things coming. And and again, all of that takes place sometime. The millennium is in there until Christ returns, and then we're just in the new heaven and the new earth. So it's, it's very simple, um, especially compared to dispensational. It's just all this time, millennium somewhere in there, and then Christ returns. Like I said, normally partial preterist. Most of the time, we're not talking about a literal thousand years. So it's just some perfect amount of time that Christ reigns on the earth. Um, most of the time they, they believe in covenant theology so there's not a big distinction between Israel and the church God doesn't have to fulfill his promises to the people of Israel they're fulfilled in the church um, and yeah so Christ returns after this millennial prosperity so really quick I want to look at this is their big distinction most of the time is preterism so actually um, initially post-millennialism and amillennialism were not separated Um, as distinct views until really early uh, 19th century probably uh, is when those things are separated because they believe a lot of the similar things. Um, When a lot of these modern day wars start happening, World War I, World War II, um, is when you get people going, okay, maybe I don't have as much of an optimistic outlook on the future as some other people do. And that's where the amillennials usually break off. But just specifically speaking, they're pretty similar and we're going to cover that stuff when we get to Ah, millennialism, but for now, um, we're going to look at Matthew 24 just really quickly um, to look at their arguments for preterism. Okay, Jesus comes out from the temple, and he was going away when his disciples came to the point out the temple buildings to him, and said to them, Do you not see all these things? Truly I say to you, not one stone here will be left upon another which will not be torn down. And so this is Christ's prophecy already of the destruction of the temple. He's saying all this is going to come down. And when does that happen? In AD 70. And so this is where they're getting the framework for their interpretation. Continuing on, verse 3. As he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us when these things will happen and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age. And Jesus answered and said to them, See to it that no one misleads you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ and will mislead many. You will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See to it that you are not frightened, for those things must take place, but that is not yet the end. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and in various places there will be famines and earthquakes. But all these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. Then they will deliver you to tribulation, and they will kill you, and you will be hated by all nations because of my name. At that time many will fall away, 
and will betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and many will mislead many because lawlessness is increased. Most people's love will grow cold, but the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which is spoken of through Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. Whoever's on the housetop must not go down to get the things that are in his house. Whoever's in the field must not turn back to get his cloak. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those nursing babies in those days. But pray that your flight will not be in the winter or on the Sabbath. For there will be great, great tribulation such as not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will, unless those had days have been cut short. No life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Okay. So he's describing a great tribulation. And specifically, the question they asked was, when is the destruction of the temple going to occur? And when is the sign of your coming? Or what's the sign of your coming? And when is the end of the age? And so the partial preterists, the post-millennialists go, oh, okay, so that happened in AD 70. And so this great tribulation that he's talking about, all of these things actually fit into that framework. If we're just talking about the destruction of the temple in AD 70. And specifically in the book of Luke, in verse 15, when it says, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which is spoken through the prophet Daniel, the book of Luke actually says, when you see, parallel passage, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies. And so that's actually what happens. Jerusalem surrounded by Roman armies. And then they kind of pull back and they think everything's okay. And then they come and destroy everything. And so the post the the partial preterists are going, this, at least this first aspect of the coming of Christ in judgment was fulfilled here. And that's kind of how they set up their framework, especially when they attack, when we talk about the millennium, is there doesn't need to be a great tribulation because the great tribulation already happened. It happened in AD 70, right? So that's how they argue there. Um, Jesus goes on to talk about, um, and, and he uses judgment language, like the lights going out, the sun, moon, and stars will be blackened, and, and things like that. But again, the preterists argue that language is actually quoting from Isaiah when God is coming in judgment before. It's just judgment language. And so that's their arguments when it comes to this passage specifically. When they get to Revelation, they'll usually say that it was written before the destruction of the temple in 70, and that those things were actually fulfilled in the destruction of the temple. Um, so they still believe Christ is going to come back one day. It's not, um, full preterism, as we call it, is, is heresy. That Christ will, all of his coming has been fulfilled. They don't believe that. Christ is going to come back, according to the post-millennialists, but um, just not in the ways that the pre-millennialists think. Let's move on to all millennialism. Um, and this is the last one we'll cover. And so like I said, the amillennialists conceive of the millennium as being the entire time from Christ's first advent to his second coming. So specifically, Christ comes. He comes in his kingdom. He inaugurates it on the earth. And he, when he defeats Satan, he throws him into the pit. And so Satan is bound when Christ defeats him on the cross. And so... Specifically, then, when you get to Revelation chapter 20 again, talking about the all-millennial perspective, they're saying that, Christ, that Satan is actually bound for a specific purpose. And it says, first one, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he threw him into the abyss and shut it and sealed it over him, so that he would not deceive the nations any longer. So that's the interpretive framework by which they understand this passage. Satan is bound so that he cannot deceive the nations any longer. What happens directly after the cross? The gospel goes out to the nations and takes massive influence over the nations and spreads like, like wildfire. We see it in the early church. And so that's the argument is... Okay, Satan is bound, but that doesn't mean he has no influence. He just doesn't have influence to deceive the nations any longer. He can't stop the nations from believing. So we go from a primary 
primarily Jewish religion to the, the gospel expanding to all the peoples of the earth. And that's specifically what we're saying. He's not deceiving the nations any longer. He's bound. Now, if you get within the realm of a dog on a chain, you're still going to get bit. So Satan, Satan is bound. He's on a chain. That doesn't mean he doesn't have any influence. It just means specifically what the millennialists are saying, that he can't deceive the nations any longer. And so that time period, that millennial reign, Christ is reigning right now in this church age, in this present time. He's reigning with his saints who have been martyred. And he's going to reign until his second coming. And specifically when we talk about um, all millennialism, though historic premillennialism is the earliest, all millennialism is by far the most attested view in church history. From Augustine, his influences over the Roman Catholic Church, and, and we can count them or not count them um, when we talk about church history. But, and then to the Reformers, his influence over the Reformers and most Protestant churches um, in the time of the Reformation. Um, and, and specifically that's because, too, for a long time it was paired with post-millennialism. But this view specifically you see in Calvin um, and a lot of the other Reformers that they believe that the millennium is the entire time between Christ's first and second advent. And so it's not going to be a literal thousand years. It's just a number that represents a perfect amount of time for Christ's reign until he comes back. And so Christ reigning now, conquering his enemies specifically through the spread of the gospel. And then he must reign until he hands the kingdom over to God the Father at the consummation of the ages. And so that's the amillennialist framework for this system. Satan's bound for a purpose. And specifically when we talk about, again, Israel and the church, we're saying the New Testament interprets the old in amillennialism. So the promises, the land promises specifically given to the nation of Israel are expanded in the new heaven and new earth and then fulfilled through Christ and his church. And that's how all millennialists would argue that the, most of the people in the New Testament, most of the apostles in the New Testament would interpret those passages. Look at um, Hebrews chapter 12. Really quickly. To see how this fleshes out. Chapter 12, starting verse 18. For you have not come to a mountain that can be touched into a blazing fire, into darkness and gloom and whirlwind, and to the blast of a trumpet and the sound of words which sound was such that you heard and begged no further words spoken to them. For if they could not bear the command, if even a beast touches the mountain, it will be stoned. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I am full of fear and trembling. But you have come to the mountain of Zion, and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to the myriad of angels, to the general assembly, the church and the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood which speaks better than the blood of Abel. And so we're saying, this Mount Zion, right, this land that was promised to the people of Israel is now being fulfilled in its giving of the new heavens and the new earth in the church. And then Amillennialists would say that there's only one return of Christ in the scriptures. And we could argue about that, and I listed some passages there, um, but we'll, we'll move on just to some conclusions. Um, they also, really quickly, would say that Amillennialism is the best way of understanding this already not yet view of the scriptures. Is that Christ is reigning now. He's really reigning now in his kingdom. But that kingdom has yet not fully been consummated. Christ has not come back and that kingdom has not been fully realized. And so there is a, a, a sense in which Christ is reigning now. And that has to be. And millennials think often that um, other views don't emphasize this enough that Christ is now in his kingdom reigning. They put off his reigning a lot of times and not most of the time not in, in word but in the way they uh, approach interpreting these things. They put off his reigning to a future date but we want to emphasize Christ is reigning now and that's 
one of the one takeaways I want to, just for all of us, um, all of the views recognize that Christ reigns. Whether it's fully realized yet, or however that fleshes itself out, Christ is reigning. He, is, he inaugurated his kingdom. He brought the kingdom to earth when he came the first time. And he is reigning now. And it's something we need to emphasize. This is, like, we can, again, these issues are hard to, to think about when we talk about all the different viewpoints and all the stuff going on, but we want to emphasize for sure that we all acknowledge that Christ will reign forever. Is reigning and will reign forever. Like we said at the beginning, there's going to be a lot of difference of opinions on these things. Um, let's show grace. Let's have a little humility, a little compassion when we talk about these things. Um, R.C. Sproul uh, used to call himself a pan-millennialist. And he said, basically, that things will pan out in the end. Right? Um, so for all of the uncertainty and for all the obscurity and for all of maybe the disagreements that we have, um, we know certain things about the scripture that God has revealed to us, certainly, in his gospel. So let's unify on those and on these things. Maybe we go... Things will pan out the way they'll pan out and we'll know all we need to know when it gets there. Um, and then obviously we just want to emphasize that all of this is to the glory of God. That's the whole purpose. The book of Revelation, Christ reigns and God is glorified. But let's pray. O oh, sovereign Lord, you are good and you have revealed to us your word, which is good. We thank you for that, Lord. Will you help us as we try to navigate these things, as we try to understand what the scripture is telling us? Jesus admonishes us to <coughs> search the signs of the times. And so we don't need to be ignorant of these things. We don't need to say, oh, we can't figure it out, so we don't even need to try. Um, but Lord, will you just help us so that we would be able to emphasize at least that you are reigning and you are glorious and you will be glorified forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Some questions.